It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Charles Benator, who will be discussing today an extremely important topic, not only for Puerto Ricans, but also for all those American citizens interested in learning about the legal history of the American Empire. This lecture is part of a series on Puerto Rico sponsored by the Center for Latin America and Caribbean and Latino Studies. And it is very fair and important to say that Sonia Alvarez, uh, its director, Gloria Bernabe, its assistant director, and Agustin Lao have been very important in finding the necessary funding uh, to bring distinguished speakers uh, to our campus. Uh, Charles Benatol is associate professor at the University of Connecticut. He's also affiliated with El Instituto, Institute of Latino, Latina, Caribbean, and Latin American Studies at the University of Connecticut. He's the author recently of Puerto Rico and the Origins of U.S. Global Empire, the Disembodied Shade, published by Rolish University Press, uh, Rolish Press in 2015. More recently, he has two important uh, articles uh, published in distinguished uh, venues. One of these articles, Exceptional Immigrants and Alternative Reading of the Federal Immigration and Naturalization Law and Policy for Puerto Rico, 1898 to 1952, deal with the issue of immigration and was published in the Latin American Research Review of the Latin American Studies Association. A second article, Extending Citizenship to Puerto Rico, Three Traditions of Inclusive Exclusions, was published in the Central Journal, the Review of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies in New York, SA. It is fair to say that Charles uh, is now a leading expert in the vicissitudes and trajectories of the history of citizenship uh, for Puerto Ricans. Closer to us, uh, Charles is part of an important cohort of Puerto Rican studies who came, sorry, Puerto Rican stu students who came to UMass to pursue their doctoral degree in our Department of Political Science. In his case, he completed both his undergraduate and graduate study here. And hopefully, in the near future, we will return to having graduate students from the island. Again, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Charles Benator, my friend Charles. Thank you. Thank you for me. I was going to say, the last time I was in this room, it was with Professor Howard Riarda, who actually kicked me out of the classroom because he, I was an undergraduate and a graduate seminar. So this is a, you know, one of those. <laughs> 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 Professor Riarda was a. Uh, we we develop our relationship later. Um, <laughs> 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 well, so, so let me tell you a little bit. Because you wanted your degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so let me give you, what I want to do today is, is sort of settle uh, or clarify some debates that I'm sort of in the, mesh, in the middle of uh, and tell you a little bit about a book project that I wrote, well, I'm sort of finishing up or revising, um, which is a history of the extension of citizenship to Puerto Rico, which has not been written. Uh, there are bits and pieces that have been written. There are parts that sort of fill the gap. Uh, but nobody has taken the time to actually document the whole history. Uh, that some people have come somewhat close. Jose Julian Alvarez Gonzalez, a law professor at the University of Puerto Rico, has come close, closest to doing this in a sort of chapter in his constitutional law book. Uh, otherwise, no one has taken the time to do this. Um, before I get to it, let me just say something for the students here, which is uh, a little bit of how I ended up doing this project, which is more an accident, a historical accident if I may. Uh, and, and what happened is when Senator John McCain was running for office or running for the presidential nomination and later for the presidency, uh, it, it occurred to me that he was not eligible to run for office because he was born in an unincorporated territory in the Panama Canal zone. Uh, but you know, and if I'm going to say something, I need to do some research. At the time, my partner, or still my partner, uh, worked in Washington, D.C. So while she was working, I would spend my days in the Law Library of Congress, uh, Library of the Department of Interior, and I started doing some in, uh, some archival research, and all of a sudden I, I stumble into this wealth of materials that have not has not been accessible to researchers. This is a moment where everything's being digitized, so all of a sudden uh, I can go spend a day at the Law Library of Congress and download 2,000 documents in PDF 
do a legal history and get everything that I need uh, or get any information that I need about Puerto Rico that has been debated in Congress. I can go to the National Archives and Records Administration and in a day I can download a 1909 survey of Puerto Rican elites that nobody seems to know anything about uh, you know, that was conducted in the island. Uh, so, so all of a sudden we have all these resources that were not available to me as a graduate student and were not available to me when I first started teaching. Uh, so this project comes out of that. It's an effort to sort of document originally why Senator John McCain was not eligible to be president, and by the way, Senator Ted Cruz is not eligible to be president either. Uh, for, uh, and it grows out of this uh, project. That's right. uh, it, second, this project in some ways is uh, so sort of a little bit of a battle that I've had with some academics um, because of a memorandum that was written in 1989 by the Congressional Research Service that was wrong but somehow became uh, the leading, the basis for the leading interpretations on the status of Puerto Ricans. And this memorandum, a 1989 Congressional Research Service memorandum, essentially stated that Puerto Ricans were uh, Jones Act citizens or citizens created by a statute in 1917 uh, and therefore Congress could essentially strip them of their citizenship at will um, because they were essentially naturalized citizenships. And birth in Puerto Rico meant birth else, uh, elsewhere outside of, of the United States. Not outside in an international sense, but, in that, but certainly outside in a constitutional sense. The interpretations grounded on that 1989 memo, which I'll discuss in a minute, or in a little bit, uh, essentially have defined all the debates uh, about Puerto Ricans, and all of the debates that led me to study the case of John McCain. In the process of, of writing that memo, Congress was holding a series of plebiscitary or status discussions in Puerto Rico, and uh, Representative Don Young argued that Puerto Ricans were less than equal citizens because they were statutory citizens according to this particular memorandum. Uh, all of a sudden, Presidents uh, Bush and Obama, Clinton, Bush and Obama began to use or coin the notion of a less than equal citizen to describe Puerto Rico in their task force memorandums. Academics embrace this argument. Uh, the courts begin to embrace this argument, or at least some of the courts, some federal courts, not all. And uh, fact checkers, news media, seem to sort of gravitate around this argument that Puerto Ricans are statutory citizens. I argue that they're all wrong, and I'm hoping to demonstrate that to you today. Um, okay, so what I want to do today, in sum, is tell you a story of five different legal debates or legal policies or laws, that are four laws and one policy debate that, has been, that have been used to describe the status, the citizenship status of Puerto Ricans between 1898 and the present. I'm going to rush a little bit because I have a lot of material, so hopefully in the question and answer I can clarify some debate. In the process of doing this research, I also stumbled, and I say stumbled because uh, th these weren't available, and it's just because I knew librarians and I uh, librarians reached out to me uh, and showed me or gave me access to these documents. I stumbled on a series of immigration uh, documents of Puerto Ricans. And Puerto Ricans were actually being naturalized in U.S. courts all the way up to 1948. Uh, and these documents are available in the Southern District of New York and the, <laughs> and the Nahara in California, all over the place. Puerto Ricans and in Dominican Republic. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. So in some ways, what's going on here is an effort to sort of clarify that history and start incorporating those debates. Uh, now, and I can later talk about the other territories. Since then, we've looked at all the territories, all the citizenship and status legislation for all five inhabited territories for the past 100 years. Samoa, Guam, Virgin Islands, and Marian Islands. And this project grows out of that study, looking at every piece of legislation that has been debated in Congress since 1898, uh, dealing with the question of citizenship uh, and the status of people. Okay. So let me begin first by clarifying the context. Um, my contention, and, and there are two arguments right now about this legal history, but my argument is that between the founding and 1898, the United States developed, simultaneously developed two traditions of territorial expansionism. Most jurists and most people who study this argument, this sort of debate, argue that there's just one tradition with lots of sort of currents. The court interprets the status of territories in varying ways, but it's all part of an interpretation of the Territories Clause. I, I, I disagree. Uh, and I want to clarify that disagreement so that you can understand my argument a little bit. 
I argue that there is a colonialist tradition and an imperialist tradition that are substantively different. When you look at all the jurisprudence relating to territories and all the jurisprudence relating to occupied territories, you can, uh, I don't, you can see a set of nuances. And I have developed this sort of chart to help you, help us, uh, or help me clarify this sort of debate. Uh, my contention is that in a colonialist tradition, the intent of uh, of territorial expansionism is to annex new territories to create states, to settle them historically with white settlers, to create today 37 new states of the Union, right, after the original 13. In the context of imperialism, what we talk about is a strategic occupation. Sometimes it's permanent, sometimes it's temporary, temporary but it's strategic for military and economic purposes. Uh, and there's very little overlap. Hawaii is the only exception that has a little bit of an overlap. Hawaii was initially occupied by essentially a bunch of Massachusetts fruit vendors with the support of the Navy, <laughs> and then in 1900 it becomes a territory. But that there's it's a little bit the story is a little bit more complex. Although otherwise every territory that has been annexed has become or annexed before 1898 became a state of the Union. Uh, whereas occupied territories just remain in some sort of vagary, uh, either temporarily or indefinitely. In the case of Native Americans, I treat as a form of imperial occupation. I don't know of any particular Native American territory before 1898 that was annexed for the purposes of creating a state of the Union where Native Americans live. There is one exception in 1909, the state of Oklahoma, but that was only by default. The United States had waged a somewhat genocidal war and essentially pushed all the remaining Native Americans into what today we call Oklahoma, and they didn't know what to do with the five civilized tribes, quote unquote. Uh, so they created Oklahoma. But that's the only exception. If you look at the legal history anteceding 1898, uh, Native American territories were treated as reservations, as a whole range of other statuses. And there was something called no man's land, which was designed to sort of essentially treat Native American territories as these sort of holding pens, in a legal sense, uh, with all kinds of sort of problems. In addition to that, all territories acquired before 1898, or next before 1898, <coughs> were treated as a part of the United States for constitutional purposes, whereas occupied territories were selectively treated as foreign in a domestic sense. And this argument dates all the way back to the British occupation and the occupation of uh, Vermont by the British, where the court insists that under occupation, a territory becomes foreign land. Uh, and occupied territories during this sort of process can be treated as part of the United States only if Congress enacts special legislation to extend constitutional parts to the territory. But they're still occupied in parts of a sovereign nation. In the case of Native Americans, there's this notion of semi-sovereignty, and at least until, depending on how you read, 1971, Congress actually used treaties to negotiate relationships with some tribes. And again, the case of Native Americans is really complex because we're talking about more than 2,000 tribes with individual treaties or relationships with the United States. Uh, but for the most part, they fall into the sort of occupied uh, tradition. All annexed territories that became states of the United States were governed under the Territories Clause of the United States. All occupied territories were governed under a range of clauses, include, including the Commander-in-Chief Clause, the Treaties Clause, the Commerce Clause. In the case of Native Americans, there is no single example of a Native American territory that has been, that has been governed under the Constitutional Authority of the Territories Clause. They're all fall in a whole range of ambiguities. There's, a, there's language in the Constitution that says Indians are not taxed, therefore they, they're outside of the Constitution because they're not taxed. Uh, the Commerce Clause is used, there's a Treaty Clause that has been used, there's a range of sort of clauses other than the Territories Clause that have been used to govern the relationship between the United States and uh, Native American territories. In terms of citizenship, before 1898, Birth in a territory and an annexed territory subject to colonization was tantamount to birth in the United States. And when the 14th Amendment is enacted, Congress extends it through something known as Revised Statute Section 1992. Essentially, birth in a territory gave the bearer of that uh, person's eligible to receive citizenship the ability to claim a U.S. citizenship at birth under the 14th Amendment. Uh, and that's been affirmed by Supreme Court uh, uh, juris uh, jurisprudence. In the case of occupied territories, occupied territories have always been treated as foreign territories for constitutional purposes. If you're born in a, in a territory that's been occupied by the United States, then you're born in, uh, as an outsider. 
the only way you can acquire <coughs> citizenship is through blood rights. In other, in, in other words, if, you're, if one of your, before 1898, if your father, so we're still living in a patrilineal system, if your father uh, was a U.S. citizen, then you could acquire your citizenship. Uh, in the case of Native Americans, it's all over the place. Treaties have been used to extend citizenship. Uh, there's been special congressional statutes. There's even uh, a notion of tribal citizenship. But the Supreme Court has always established that birth in the Native American territory is tantamount to birth elsewhere. In fact, the 14th Amendment, the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment, the law that confers birthright citizenship in the United States, does not apply today to a Native American territory. Uh, and the court has not overturned that decision, and I hope they will still. Uh, in terms of the Bill of Rights, if you lived in a territory, the full Bill of Rights applied to you. If you live in an uh, occupied territory, only certain rights apply to individuals. And in the case of Native Americans, Congress has, go has, has gone through the process of piecemeal extending certain civil rights. Some civil rights don't apply in Native American territories today. Okay. This is the landscape, I argue, in 1898 when the United States acquires Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Um, so I argue that what we end up seeing in 1898 is essentially uh, a U.S. military policy that decides, uh, that, that begins to shape a new territorial doctrine, which has been described as the third view, large policy. I use a sort of global expansionist notion to describe it. And what we see is a group of, of naval architects, if you will, or navalists in the U.S. military that began to contemplate the possibility of expanding beyond the U.S. borders uh, at a global scale. They are seeing the ability of acquire islands throughout the world and creating coaling stations in such a way that it would enable the United States to essentially battle other global empires. These were refuted, these were perceived as strategic military bases that could enable the United States to essentially expand its sphere of influence and expand its protective borders outside of the United States. And they envisioned doing this all over the world. Um, the problem was, how do you deal with a constitutional legal system or constitutional set of presidents, the colonialist president, that essentially requires the United States to grant rights, citizenship, change the territorial status of an of, of a, an ex territory. So the military meant a new policy. Um, and I argue, and again, I, I want to distinguish myself or differentiate myself from other scholars, I argue that the military essentially crafts the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the particular territorial policy, Congress normalizes, and the United States in the insular cases essentially rubber stamps it and says, yes, there's a new constitutional doctrine that's going to be used to justify this new territorial policy. There are four basic elements of the new territorial policy that emerge from this, from this sort of process. And it's a process that begins in 1898 and essentially culminates sometime between 1901 and 1904. <clears throat> the idea is to break from the constitutional presence of the colonialist and imperialist tradition, allowing the United States to selectively combine elements from both traditions, from both jurisprudential traditions. So territory can be annexed and permanently acquired, and still govern as an occupied or temporarily uh, held territory. Does that make sense? Uh, so in other words, the United States can, decide, can say, okay, Puerto Rico is now a part of the United States, but we're going to treat it as an occupied territory, even though it's been formally annexed. Um, the second <coughs> element is something that has been described as a functionalist uh, approach, which essentially says Congress and the President of the United States can selectively develop individual policies for each territory. In that way, we're not bound by the constitutional precedents established by the colonialist tradition, which defines how annexed territories are going to be treated. Since then, Congress and the United States has had individual laws and policies for each territory that have varied. And it's difficult, almost impossible, to use constitutional precedents from one another to essentially rule on the legalities or constitutional standing of a particular policy in a particular territory. So, for example, Whereas in Puerto Rico today, person anyone born in Puerto Rico today acquires birthright citizenship. If you're born in American Samoa today, you only acquire a nationality. And if you want to acquire U.S. citizenship, you have to travel to Hawaii or California and go through a naturalization process. 
Uh, and you say, well, hold on, isn't American Samoa an, an unincorporated territory like Puerto Rico? Why can't uh, we use the same president to essentially force the U.S. government to grant American Samoans the ability to become citizens uh, uh, in a more and a less burdensome way? Uh, but I'll, I'll clarify that in a minute. Uh, the third. Uh, the third argument is that annexed territories are now selectively governed as foreign locations, foreign countries, in a domestic or constitutional sense. Whereas the imperialist tradition allowed Congress to treat occupied territories as foreign in a domestic sense, or domestic or constitutional sense, <coughs> the new tradition allows the United States to treat annexed territories, territories that are now formally part of the United States, as uh, foreign locations, depending on the issue. And I'll clarify this in a second. Uh, and then fi the final uh, contribution of this new tradition is that territories, unincorporated territories, and I'll clarify this in a second, uh, are going to be acquired in a global scope. The, the new territorial tradition is going to be part of a global tradition of, of expansionism. Whereas the colonialist and imperialist traditions were more centered on continental annexation or hemispheric annexation. Again, Hawaii and Alaska were seen as outliers, but the f general focus of Manifest Destiny or U.S. expansionism was limited to the creation of a continental system. The new tradition that starts in 1898 opens up the possibility that the United States could have military bases, islands, possessions, territories, anywhere around the world, and could exercise its influence at a global level. Uh, and this is when legal scholars are starting to contemplate uh, the idea that the United States can become a global power. Most academics tend to situate the emergence of the United States as a global power in the aftermath of the Second World War with the development of the military-industrial complex. But the courts, the military, were already thinking about the United States as a global power in 1898. At least they had the ideolo ideological foundations to enable the United States to become a global power. In enabling, I mean legally enabling. Okay. Uh, the last report by the military governor in Puerto Rico, George uh, a military dictator, by the way, because of <laughs> the hostilities that ceased in 1898. So we have a military governor that's exercising functions as a military dictator. Essentially summarizes the argument that I want to convey to you. And I quote, uh, the scope of the orders that we're giving to the military governors of Puerto Rico is very wide. Almost every branch of administration, political, civil, financial, and judicial was affected by their provisions. These are the orders that are given to the military governors to essentially colonize Puerto Rico in a way that enables the United States to enter uh, and establish itself a foothold in the island. It may be that the military governors exceeded their authority when they changed the codes, the provisions of which were not in conflict with the political character, institutions, and constitution of the United States. But in the absence of instructions to the contrary, it was conceived to be the privilege and duty of the military commanders to make use of such means with a view to adapting the system of local laws and administration to one which, judging from precedence, Congress might be expected to enact for the island, thus preparing the latter for a territorial regime when Congress should be ready to authorize it. It has been pointed out that the course adopted is understood to have been tacitly, at least, approved by Congress for, with two slight exceptions specified in the foreground, every order promulgated by the military government uh, has been confirmed by a congressional enactment, has become part of the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Law of the Land, the insular cases, uh, and will so remain until abrogated or changed by Congress or by the Legislative Assembly of the Island. In other words, uh, Governor Davis acknowledges or admits or describes how <laughs> the policies created by the military essentially are normalized by Congress and institutionalized by the Supreme Court. This has not changed in, in some ways in Congress, and I'll get to that in, in a second, at least not legally. Okay, so what's the final new tradition? Uh, the new territorial tradition that emerges, generally known as the Doctrine of Territorial Incorporation, essentially treats annexed territories as strategic or economic uh, locations, and there is no plan for statehood. In other words, the Supreme Court has repeatedly stated, Congress has repeatedly stated, that unincorporated territories, which is the status that's ascribed to these territories, uh, means that it's not meant to become a state of the Union. It's not designed, even though it's annexed, it's not designed to become a future state of the Union. In fact, no territory acquired after 1898 has become a state of the Union, and Congress has not made any intention to acquire any, uh, any new territory or any new state. Uh, Hawaii and Alaska, which were the last te uh, territories that became states in 1959, were acquired prior to 1898. The interpretation that emerges in terms of the constitutional source of power 
is that the territories clause can be expanded and gives the United States more power than that previously granted by past jurisprudence, jurisprudence enacted or, or rule or, or, or established before 1898. Uh, the citizenship provisions for unincorporated territories range from extending the 14th Amendment uh, to the island, as was the case of the U.S. Virgin Islands in 1947, to essentially creating a nationality, which I'll explain in a second, uh, to govern the inhabitants of the island. In terms of the rights, only fundamental rights are extended to territories. And, and wh when I say this, I mean that Congress has the power to cherry pick which laws are going to be extended to unincorporated territories and can selectively withhold or extend, unless the Supreme Court says a particular territory, a particular bill of right, a particular right is considered fundamental. Uh, so, for example, today the right to trial by jury is not a constitutional guaranteed right in Puerto Rico and in most territories. In fact, it's possible to argue that undocumented immigrants living in the United States have more constitutional protections than U.S. citizens born and living in places like Puerto Rico or un other unincorporated territories. Now, let me just say, in, in the last book uh, that, I, that Professor Alejandro mentioned, what I do is I explain how the legal precedents have been used to essentially govern Guantanamo Bay, uh, establish all the legal presence that the Bush and later Obama administrations used to wage this war on terror. All territories acquired after 1898 have been governed by these fundamental principles. When you look at the jurisprudence and all the debates in the Supreme Court and in Congress, they all go back to the insular cases to essentially find a justification for torture, for uh, <laughs> renditions, ex uh, extraterritorial renditions for drone attacks for Guantanamo. They're all, they're all anchored in the case of Puerto Rico, or rather in Downs versus Bidwell, which is the leading Supreme Court ruling on the status of Puerto Rico. And these are the basic principles. Does that, does that make sense? And I can say more about that if you're interested later. Okay, so why do I want to say this? The main point that I want you to take out of here is that Puerto Rico can be treated, Puerto Rico can be treated as a foreign country or as a part of the United States, depending on what Congress wants to do and in what context. And Congress can extend the 14th Amendment or the Citizenship Clause of the 14th Amendment, or it can use something else to govern Puerto Ricans. Or for that matter, all the unincorporated territories, which are all the territories that have been leased or annexed or acquired or occupied after 1898. Okay. Uh, so let me start my story. Uh, when the United States occupies Puerto Rico, or annexes Puerto Rico, it creates, it begins to create a new type of citizenship status, or a new type of membership status, a territorial membership, if you will, uh, which is first articulated in the Article 9, or first clause of Article 9 of the Treaty of Paris of 1899, okay. <coughs> the year that the Senate ratifies the particular treaty. And basically what Article 9 said is that, or the first clause of Article 9 says, is that the inhabitants of Puerto Rico, persons born in an insular territory or Puerto Rico, uh, can only claim a Puerto Rican or local nationality or local citizenship. This means that Spanish subjects that were residing in Puerto Rico that had been born in Puerto Rico, remember Puerto Rico was at the time a province of Spain, can only retain a local nationality or local citizenship. They cannot, they cannot naturalize or they cannot acquire their Spanish citizenship, according to the, to the Treaty of Paris. Peninsular born, or Spanish subjects residing in Puerto Rico who were born in Spain, can naturalize and acquire a U.S. citizenship, can retain their Spanish citizenship, or can acquire a local citizenship. And this would be in place all the way up to 1906, and I'll clarify in a second. So that new nationality, which the Supreme Court in, later in, in, uh, in Gonzalez I mean, Williams uh, defines as a non-alien nationality, essentially placed Puerto Ricans in this sort of ambiguous uh, location. Not quite a citizen of the United States, but not quite an alien. The Foraker Act, Section five, 7 of the Foraker Act of 1900, affirms this particular logic and places uh, a system of government that will treat all persons born in Puerto Rico as nationals or non-alien nationals. Now, the creation of a non-alien nationality, or Puerto Rican citizenship, which by the way has never been overturned. <coughs> but legally, if you look at the U.S. Code today, it is still possible to become a Puerto Rican citizen. It's not clear how, but it is still possible. <laughs> uh, because the courts have said, in most cases, with the exception of Juan Maduras, that it's impossible to be a Puerto Rican citizen. Even though you can be a Mariana Island citizen, 
uh, in the Marian Islands, which is also an unincorporated territory. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the, the ambiguities. But it, it, that notion of a nationality, which would be in place for, in, in the case of American Samoa, is still in place, essentially established that Puerto Ricans were located somewhere in between. Not aliens, not foreigners, not quite uh, citizens of the United States. That, that particular legal construction created a series of problems uh, that resulted in clashes with federal law. So, for example, in the civil service laws of the United States, you had to be a citizen in order to work in the U.S. government. So, <laughs> Puerto Rican officials who were uh, needed to work in the U.S. government in Puerto Rico could not work because they weren't citizens and weren't allowed to become citizens. Because under the prevailing immigration laws or naturalization laws, in order to become a U.S. citizen, you had to renounce your allegiance to a sovereign and then a, a undergo a naturalization process. So for our Puerto Rican national citizen, renouncing an allegiance meant renouncing an allegiance to the United States in order to undergo a naturalization process. And Puerto Ricans were caught in that ambiguity. Uh, it created a problem for businessmen and other individuals who were traveling, particularly in, uh, in order to acquire passports. You had to be a citizen in order to acquire a U.S. passport to travel. There was no such thing as a Puerto Rican passport at the time. Um, so Congress and the State Department and the U.S. government began piecemeal, but piecemeal, begin solving and addressing these issues on a piecemeal basis. It is true that there are, there are some cases where Puerto Ricans somehow magically are allowed to naturalize, or some judges essentially looked the other way and allowed some Puerto Ricans to naturalize between 1900 and 1906. Uh, but those are exceptions that were essentially, in my opinion, the result of judges exercising autonomy over naturalization cases. They weren't legal, legally sanctioned. Does that make sense? I mean, they're legally sanctioned if a judge says they're legal. But the, there is no federal law that has allowed Puerto Ricans to naturalize until 1906. Okay. So the first law that allows Puerto Ricans formally, to, or Puerto Ricans or the residents of insular areas to naturalize was enacted in 1906. It's the Bureau of Immigration Act which essentially uh, granted Puerto Ricans the ability to travel to the United States or to a state or to incorporate territory, establish a two-year residency, uh, and undergo a naturalization process. And here's an example of a 1915 case, which I'll say something in a second about. Uh, Puerto Ricans could travel to New York City, and they did travel to New York City, and they could apply for a U.S. citizenship uh, or to any U.S. territory or state, and they could essentially go to a district court and say, I want to become a citizen and fill out the paperwork and <laughs> become a citizen. This is a 1915 case, uh, but there are other cases. I've found plenty of other cases. And the reason for that was primarily, again, to sort of address all the contradictions created by this notion of the national, the Puerto Rican national. Um, what I found, and here I, I want to make sure that if there's any graduate student or anybody interested in this sort of research, what I have found is that the four cases that we see, the four disputes that we'll see between 1906 in 1917, and federal courts and U.S. courts generally deal with the question of coverture, uh, military service, labor migration, and, and the Spanish sort of heritage. Let, let me clarify that in a second. Uh, essentially, the rules of coverture still apply to Puerto Rico and would be in place until 1934, and I'll clarify this. Is anybody familiar with coverture? So under prevailing U.S. <laughs> law, if you're a woman and you're married an alien, your marriage was a form of automatic naturalization, and your child acquired the citizenship of your husband. In the United States, that would be in place until 1922, until the enactment of the Cable Act, uh, or at least that's when the United States begins to chip away at the, the coverture. Uh, so a lot of women who married their neighbors without thinking that they were Spanish citizens automatically lost their citizenship, and by extension, the children have lost their citizenship or acquired their Spanish citizenship. And this would be in place in, the, in Puerto Rico for a long time. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a second. In terms of the military, in 1914, Congress enacts legislation that allows the residents of the insular areas, or persons born in the insular areas, to essentially count the military service as a form of residency in a state. So U.S. citizens who serve in the Coast Guard or Carter Service at the time, the, Na uh, the Navy, the Marines, the U.S. military, can count their service as part of a residence process. In this case, the case of Incla Socorro Giralde, the court essentially affirms the ability of a Puerto Rican to essentially become a U.S. citizen through naturalization. This case was heard in 1915 in Maryland. Uh, like this, there are tons of cases. There are also lots of problems with labor migration. Particularly in the 1900s, U.S. Uh, companies go to Puerto Rico to recruit migrants 
send migrants to work in Hawaii or the Virgin Islands or elsewhere in the beet uh, farms in California, and they are unable to become U.S. citizens. So the 1906 law it allows individuals who are not in Puerto Rico to essentially undergo a naturalization process and become a U.S. citizen as a result of their labor status. And again, I haven't looked at district courts in California yet, but I am told there are plenty of documents of Puerto Ricans who petitioned U.S. citizenship as early as 1900, and some are granted. I haven't looked at that, but this is a great project for anybody who's interested in immigration. Um, okay. This, the U.S. individual immigration process for Puerto Ricans would be in place until 1948. I'll clarify that in a minute. But essentially, Puerto Ricans were allowed or required in some instances to undergo an individual naturalization process in order to either acquire U.S. citizenship or to retain their U.S. citizenship all the way up to 1948 when Congress essentially rectifies this problem. So we, you can find immigration documentation of individual Puerto Ricans asking for U.S. citizenship uh, on up to 1948. And these are available in various narrow archives, the Archivo General de Puerto Rico, uh, and district courts throughout the United States. And I'll say more about this in a second. Why is this important? For some reason, this story has not been told. The prevailing story about the citizenship status of Puerto Ricans begins in 1917. <laughs> the individual naturalization process seems to sort of elude scholars and historians. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time, and I'm only halfway there. Okay, the third debate begins in 1917. In 1917, Congress enacts legislation providing for the collective naturalization of Puerto Rico, or the residents of Puerto Ricans. The problem is that the Jones Act of 1917 does not change the territorial status of Puerto Rico. So persons born in Puerto Rico in 1918, or a couple days after, 19, after the law is passed, let's say in June uh, 1917, can only acquire U.S. citizenship if their father was a U.S. citizen. So under prevailing rules of coverture, women who married fo foreigners or aliens uh, acquire their husband's citizenship and their children acquire that citizenship. <coughs> so you will see between 1917 and 1934, uh, thousands of Puerto Ricans who were stateless and who had no citizenship. This was complicated. On, on top of that, because if women chose to divorce their husbands or became widows, they were left in this sort of ambiguous status. Because Puerto, women who were born in Puerto Rico and acquired citizenship under the Jones Act or any uh, congressional legislation were not considered native born. They were considered naturalized uh, citizens for immigration purposes. What's important about the Jones Act, and I'm going to rush this, but I can clarify in a little bit, uh, if anybody's interested, is that there are essentially two options. Puerto Rican citizens could choose to become U.S. citizens, and 288 Puerto Ricans said they didn't want a U.S. citizenship, mostly for economic purposes, uh, or you can simply do nothing and uh, acquire U.S. citizenship by collective naturalization. That, the, the, there's some, uh, there's some, uh, there's Supreme Court jurisprudence that essentially affirms the ability of the United States to contradict itself. Uh, because in the previous uh, jurisprudence, when co uh, the court had established that the collective naturalization of a territory meant that the territory was going to be incorporated or becomes a part of the United States for constitutional purposes. Here the Supreme Court says, well, not in the case of Puerto Rico. We're not going to apply those precedents in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, even though the decision was, was part of Downs versus Bidwell. So what you have is a sort of shift to a contradiction based on essential empire arbitrary policies enacted by the courts at a local level and at a federal level and by Congress, where Puerto Ricans are now able to acquire U.S. citizenship if their father is a U.S. citizen. Congress amends the Jones Act four, in four occasions, uh, three before 1940. Uh, in 1927, Section 5A, which is the First Amendment to the Citizenship Clause of the Jones Act, essentially established that those Puerto Ricans who had chosen not to re, uh, gain a U.S. citizenship could now do so within a period of time if they wish. And they just had to go file a declaration of allegiance in a district court and they could acquire U.S. citizenship automatically. Uh, it also allows when they were Puerto Rican citizens, who had, uh, the children of foreigners who had not acquired a U.S. citizen, to go to a district court in Puerto Rico and acquire uh, a U.S. citizenship by simply filing a form. In 1934, Congress then uh, again amends the, fork, uh, the Jones Act, I'm sorry, Section 5 of the Jones Act, and extends essentially two important sort of modifications. 
First, the Cable Act of 1922 is extended to Puerto Rico, which allows women, Puerto Rican women who were stateless at the time, to reacquire U.S. citizenship or at least not lose it under the rules of coverture. They are now protected by this notion of that uh, this notion of the Cable Act, which allows some women to retain their citizenship if they're <coughs> widowed, uh, divorced, or if they are some sort of ambiguity among their status. That also allows women to transmit their citizenship to their children. Remember, in 1934, Congress is talking about something like 10,000 Puerto Ricans who were stateless or who did not have citizenship. And this is part of the legislation. It's designed to correct that problem. Uh, and, in t and in addition to that, the 1934 amendment essentially retroactively naturalizes every inhabitant of Puerto Rico. Uh, this will occur again in 1938, where Congress enacts a, a further amendment to retroactively uh, naturalize all the inhabitants of Puerto Rico. But again, the problem is that they don't change the territorial status of the island. So if you're born in Puerto Rico, you're still born outside of the United States, and you don't acquire citizenship by birth. You can only acquire a naturalized form of citizenship. Um, in 1933, President, uh, then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt convenes an interagency group essentially to fix this problem, not just in Puerto Rico, but in all the territories and in the United States. Because what we saw between 1898 and 1933 was that there was a naturalization law that established certain sort of forms of, uh, of acquiring citizenship. There were immigration laws that had certain citizenship provisions, and then there were citizenship laws. And all three sort of strands of laws were in conflict with one another. So persons born in Puerto Rico uh, were subject sometimes to immigration laws, to naturalization laws, or to citizenship laws. Uh, so President Roosevelt decides to convene this committee to uh, adopt a new law that's going to reconcile immigration, naturalization, and citizenship laws of the United States and create one nationality code. Um, what's important about this law, I'm sorry, this is also, again, a 1940 declaration of intention. This is a woman who traveled from New York to Puerto Rico on a visit, uh, and when she comes back, she finds out that she's not a citizen, even though she'd been living in, in New York City since the 1920s and had been participating in voting and elections. <laughs> and the reason she's not a citizen, and no, she's, but she lived a life uh, in, in New York City. The reason she didn't know she was a citizen, she assumed that the Jones Act had naturalized her. But in her case, her father was a Spanish subject who never acquired a U.S. citizen. So she acquired her father's citizenship. Unless she underwent an individual naturalization process, she could not acquire a citizen. So she goes to Puerto Rico on a vacation, goes back to New York, and is told, you know, sorry, you're going to Ellis Island. Now, it wasn't as complex then, but she was required to, f to go through an individual naturalization process as late as 1940. Uh, so part of the problem is that uh, the Congress and, and President Roosevelt want to address these kinds of, sort of anomalies that are present. And this is, a, this is in the Southern District of New York uh, <coughs> Federal Court. Oops, that was my last point. Okay, uh, so what the New Nationality Act does is essentially says, Section 101D. From now on, Puerto Rico is going to be a geographical part of the United States. It's going to be part of the United States for the purposes of extending citizenship. And Congress essentially extends birthright citizenship or the rule of usually to Puerto Rico, uh, specifically through the Section 101D. In addition to that, Section 202 essentially states that Puerto Rico is going to be incorporated for the purposes of extending citizenship. In other words, any person born in Puerto Rico from January 12, 1941, the effective date of, of the law, is going to be considered a birthright citizenship. Citizen of the United States, a native-born citizen of the United States. This law was based, if you read the legislative history, on the 1927 law enacted for the Virgin Islands, which essentially extended the 14th Amendment, or rather the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment, to Puerto Rico. So all persons born in Puerto Rico since 1941, January 12, 1941, are entitled to a native-born status Whereas all persons born before acquire either nationality, Puerto Rican citizenship, or acquire a naturalized citizenship. You know, if they acquired a citizenship, it was only naturalized. Okay, soon after, uh, you start seeing a lot of sort of efforts to amend a particular denaturalization section, known as Section 404C, which established that Puerto Ricans who acquired their citizenship before 1941 and resided outside of the United States for more than five years 
were automatically denaturalized. And this is part of an immigration law at the time. If you were a naturalized immigrant anywhere in the United States and chose to go outside of the United States and work or live for more than five years without going back to the United States, you were automatically denaturalized. And the idea was that the United States did not want to naturalize citizens who were just going to use the citizenship to acquire privileges around the world. So between 1940 and 1948, Bolivar Pagan, a resident commissioner of Bolivar Pagan, led our resident commissioner, Fernando Cicern, argue that Puerto Ricans uh, should be excluded from the immigration clause. Um, if you go to the Chivo General de Puerto Rico, you will find cases of Puerto Ricans living in Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, and Mexico, petitioning local governors for reinstatement of their citizenship because they have been automatically denaturalized. And there are tons of files that are, some are really impressive. Uh, in the United States, the State Department was essentially stripping Puerto Ricans who were citizens before 1940 of their citizenship. This would be corrected in 1948 uh, in what I described as the Bolivar Pagan Fernos Cern Amendment, which established or amended the Jones Act one more time and established that all persons born in Puerto Rico between 1898, I'm oh, sorry, April 11, 1899, and 1940 and 1945 are going to be treated as native-born purposes for immigration law purposes. In other words, they cannot be stripped of their citizenship. Since 1948, anyone born in Puerto Rico who acquires a U.S. citizenship either through naturalization before 1940 or through birthright after 1941 uh, acquires the status of a native-born citizen, according to Congress. The 1952 Immigration Nationality Act, if you read the legislative history, basically says uh, we're just going to copy the 1940 Act with the 1948 Amendment. Okay. Uh, <coughs> why is this important? As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, in 1989, uh, the Congressional Research Service essentially uh, issues a memo stating that Puerto Ricans acquired a U.S. citizenship under the Jones Act of 1917, ignored all the debates that happened after 1917, in 1917 and 1952, all the legislation that was passed, in other words, it stated that Puerto Ricans born in Puerto Rico are Jones Act citizens, naturalized citizens. It also stated, and I quote, Puerto Rico, wherever its exact status and relationship to the United States, is not itself in the United States. It's somewhere in the penumbra zone, <laughs> somewhere between interna the international and the domestic, uh, elsewhere. And I don't want to use Derry that too loosely, but, I, uh, but it is in the Netherlands or somewhere. Uh, in addition to that, because Puerto Rico is not in the United States, memo stated, the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment does not extend to Puerto Rico. It follows that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens by virtue of congressional statute, and if Congress wants to strip Puerto Ricans automatically of their citizenship, it can do so because the Jones Act, like any other act, is simply a naturalization statute. Now, Jose Julian Alvarez Gonzalez quickly responded to this argument, but he claims that the 1940 Act essentially naturalized uh, Puerto Ricans in a different way than the Jones Act, uh, and but based on Supreme Court jurisprudence, that argument falls apart. I argue that the language of Congress uh, in the 19, 1940 Nationality Act and the debates that lead up to the 1948 Amendment and then 1952 unequivocally established that for citizenship purposes only, Puerto Rico is in the United States uh, and birth in Puerto Rico is tantamount to birth in the United States under the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment. My argument is based on legislation not on jurisprudence because the Supreme Court has not cl uh, clarified this argument. Why is this important? Uh, because nobody seems to want to deal with the question of the 1940-1952 legislative assembly, uh, legislative debates. In fact, the two direct responses to this debate were a group of Puerto Ricans who chose to denaturalize themselves or self-expatriate to travel elsewhere outside of the United States to other countries and renounce their U.S. citizenship and pursue a Puerto Rican citizenship, with the exception of one person, uh, Juan Marie Ras, uh, the courts and the State Department refused to grant them the ability to self-expatriate. Or there is the case of uh, David Efron, which uh, took his young daughter to Florida, established a five-year residence. Uh, David Efron was born in Cuba but had migrated to Puerto Rico and then took his daughter, who was born in Puerto Rico, to, to, Orange, uh, to uh, Miami, rather, uh, they come. And, uh, and essentially established a five-year residence and then went to the INA, immigration, INSA, Immigration Naturalization Service, and petitioned for a naturalization. And the case actually goes all the way up to the Supreme Court and back. Uh, and the court says, no, the 1940 Act already granted you uh, birthright citizenship, 
if something changes in the status of Puerto Rico, then the court, then Congress will have to deal with it. But for now, we recognize that your daughter already has birthright citizenship. So you have, uh, or you have, she, your daughter has a birthright citizenship that may be statutory. It's not clear. So you have the courts responding or saying Puerto Ricans can't be U.S. citizens, constitutional citizens, under the logic of the CRS memorandum. They cannot renounce their U.S. citizenship, and they cannot naturalize uh, in order to acquire a constitutional citizenship. So Puerto Ricans now, if, if you accept the CRS memorandum and the argument that the pres most presidents since Bill Clinton onwards have used, and Congress, and <laughs> some federal, lower federal courts, if you accept that arguments in Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans are located in this sort of ambiguous space. They're statutory citizens without the ability of renouncing their citizenship or self-expatriating, acquiring a naturalized citizenship in order to acquire U.S. citizenship, or claiming a constitutional status. I argue that they're wrong based on the Southern legislation, but I'm, I'm telling you this. I'm not sure anybody's listening in Washington or elsewhere. Uh, but the argument today stands that Puerto Ricans are considered statutory citizenship citizens, not because any legislation that was passed, but because of the CRS memorandum <coughs> of 1989. Uh, and for some reason, academics and lawmakers and policymakers embrace this argument. Okay, so let me stop there and leave you with two thoughts. Uh, for those of you who are interested in looking at this project, uh, or uh, research around this project, there are plenty of naturalization proceedings available in archives in the NARA, National Archives and Records Administration, uh, and in district courts all over the United States. And today, you just have to take a thumb drive and look and download, and you have access to a ton of material that's not otherwise available. Uh, and the databases that are available in these archives, particularly in Washington, D.C., give you full range of documents. So for example, if you want to look at the legal history of a document, it'll give you the congressional record of debates, the laws, the uh, record of the proceedings, the reports, everything with one click. So <laughs> research is open to you. If you want to look at naturalization documents, and I do encourage people to do this because we don't know, we don't have enough of a history of, of the story, uh, these documents are also available uh, uh, in the United States and in Puerto Rico. The Chivo General de Puerto Rico has a ton of documents, and citizenship documents that have not been studied just requires somebody with enough resources to spend time digging and, and being patient enough to sort of understand. The other issue that I want to encourage people is to think about these debates in these sort of periodization because it <coughs> enables you to understand what the immigration documents are responding to. This is not, this, these documents aren't occurring in a vacuum. In fact, if you, you can't say it from here, but if you look at this, this is a response to a 1938 amendment of the Jones Act, and it's clearly stated there. So unless you're looking for an amendment of the, the 1938 amendment, you're not going to find these documents. But <laughs> this is why this story is really important, to open up access to documents that are available. Okay, let me stop there. I tried to rush as much as I can because I promised to do this in 45 minutes, but I, I keep going on talking for another hour. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to run out. So I'm gonna try to ask the first question, and I'm gonna resist the impulse to ask the question whether a Cuban guy born in Canada can be a natural born U.S. citizen uh -huh. um, and run for president. Um, but my so the complicated question is, um, in my mind, not just how can we sort through these statuses and the various ways that the U.S. colonial and imperial tradition is made sense of through jurisprudence, but really actually why? And here's what I mean. So, I mean, I could make it more, I could complicate your argument about the 19th century. You know why it's more, why it could be more complicated. And really the question is like, so for purposes of thinking, do you want to make some straight lines? And it seems to me like the, another way to go about it is, as critical legal studies scholars do, which is sort of to say, why, do Puerto, why can Puerto Ricans be naturalized after the Jones Act? Well, because they're Puerto Rican, right? It's like the question, why is killing Trayvon Martin not murder? Because he's black, right? In other words, the jurisprudence responds to social formations of power, not to its own internal logic which is the other way to go with what do we do with like the incredible multiplicity of statuses that sort of runs for, um, all the way from, the, from Hawaii and the Mariana Islands through Puerto Rico to the Iraqi Green Zone. 
Um, so can you tell me more about why, why work it through the jurisprudence question? You're absolutely right. Uh, the jurisprudence question is different than the social question because there are the other debates that are happening simultaneously. Uh, in my case, what I want to do is establish a baseline. I, and I would argue that in the jurisprudence, you have two strengths. You have an administrative strength. Uh, bureaucracies are complaining that the citizenship debates applied to Puerto Rico don't work, can't be reconciled with immigration laws, naturalization laws, and they're creating all kinds of problems. There are people stuck all over the world trying to come, come into the United States or go back to Puerto Rico. So there's that administrative dimension that I think has been downplayed historically. The second dimension uh, is that there are debates that are occurring, there are social debates that are occurring in Congress, the Supreme Court, racist debates, sexist debates, misogynist debates that are occurring that are worked out in this legislation. And these are individual things that, that I think are isolated in some way. I mean, they're a continuation of, so, of social debates, but are also isolated in some way from what's going out what's happening outside society. So in that sense, yes, you're absolutely right. My concern, again, is that when we analyze the case of Puerto Rico, we don't talk about the 1906 law that says individual Puerto Ricans can naturalize, and they do naturalize, mostly soldiers. Uh, we don't talk about coverture. I mean, I, I, I wrote a piece on coverture about four or five years ago, and it seemed to be news for a lot of scholars who I respect a lot, who I think have, I've learned a lot about. Because they weren't thinking about, they were thinking about voting rights or labor rights or other issues, but they weren't thinking about women in Puerto Rico who are losing their citizenship by way of marriage without even knowing it. Uh, so in that sense, I completely agree the political and social debates in some ways are different. In other ways, there's an overlap. I just want to do the basic lead work so that we can begin to have this conversation, I think, in a more serious way than what's been happening. So yes, I, I agree. Thank you. Yes. I mean, in, in sort of following up on that, it's the it's the you know what 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 kind of comparative inferences can we draw from from your analysis of jurisprudence that would apply to you know not just other immigrant groups but illegal immigrants? I mean, so what's behind the jurisprudence in that sense? And what or a different way to answer, ask the question would be like what can Puerto Rico teach us? Um, this experience of Puerto Rico teach us about struggles around statuses uh, as they've played out. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, an obvious question in terms of 1898 was, you know, what happens in an in-between case? What, did this happen, what you described, for instance, did this happen everywhere there were military governors? So did this happen in Cuba between, you know, 1902 and 1906, and then in 1911 to 1917, or in, what, or in, in Nicaragua under, under Walker? No, that was before. But, you know, were there other moments where this case in terms of the jurisprudence, even if we isolate the jurisprudence, can be instructive for our thinking more generally about citizenship. So, so the insular cases, insular cases, the yeah. 1901 insular cases, which I argue really aren't part of this tradition of jurisprudence. They're really an effort by the Supreme Court to affirm what the military was telling them to say. And if you read the Downs versus Junior Bimbo carefully, you will see in the concurrent opinion of Justice White, which is the leading opinion that will define the insular cases an allusion to coaling stations and military bases. And he tells us, yeah, we need coaling stations and military bases, and this is part of my logic. My argument is that the jurisprudence is really a normalization of a new military part of policy. So in that sense, what happens from, I argue between 1898 and 1901, when this new territorial doctrine is organized, what happens onward is the logic created by the Department of War uh, a legal logic created by the Department of War to essentially enable the United States to go around the world and conquer places. What the insular, what this, it's not just the insular cases, the insular cases, the four corrected, but I, I will describe as global empire, which is the combination of the military's logic, Congress, and the Supreme Court. What, what happens is that they also create this logic of some legal scholars describe as functionalism, which allows the US government to, to use particular policies in each place. Before 1898, if you're going to use a legal argument, you're bound, in theory, to follow presidents. Mm -hmm. And the new president allows the United States to say, well, each place is different, therefore we're going to have different policies. So for example, when I used it in the, in the previous book, when I explained how the United States used the insular cases to justify torture, uh, their argument was, well, if you look at the jurisprudence, and again, there's a fetish, with jurisprudence. The Bush administration wanted to have a legal argument to justify everything. 
But if you look at the memorandums, they'll say, well, Verdugo Orquides, which is based on the Downs versus Bidwell, basically says if they're outside of the United States, the Constitution doesn't apply, therefore the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. So that person can't make a Fourth Amendment claim, plus it's not a fundamental right applied to people. So if they'll, you look at all, if you look at all the legislation, memorandums, and jurisprudence, they're going to anchor all kinds of, they anchor all kinds of policies on this foundational moment of Puerto Rico, or more precisely in Downs versus Bidwell. Uh, Guantanamo Bay, the logic was, well, it's not in the United States, but it's not outside of the United States, it's in between, therefore international law doesn't apply, nor does the Constitution. <laughs> right. I mean, that was the argument in Rasul. And you look, you follow the footnotes and, well, we did it for Puerto Rico, so what? Downs versus Bidwell uh -huh. allows okay. us to do it, therefore that's the legal precedent that we did. For drones, for kidnapping, for New York is, meaning the U.S. can go kidnap anywhere, anybody around the world, and bring them to the United States, prosecute them, lock them up without giving them access to the Fourth or Fifth Amendment's uh, protections. Uh, when, you, when you start looking at all these other debates after 1898, they, they go back to this particular piece of jurisprudence that had nothing to do. The, the court was simply affirming a new insular sort of policy that would give the military the ability to make whatever cases, they wanted, wherever they, wherever they wanted. Now, in the case of, of the other territories, what we see is that they all <coughs> follow the Puerto Rico precedent. So, one would remain a military base until 1950, 52. And between that period, they're governed, uh, Romanians were governed as nationals. In 1952, they're granted the ability to become uh, birthright citizens. And the, when you look at the legislation, it's all based on the case of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, American Samoans today, Samoans are nationals. And the nationality that's applicable to American Samoans was first developed in the Treaty of Paris and really in the fourth rack of 1900 for Puerto Rico. So today, for more than 100 years, <laughs> they're still nationals. Uh, Mariana Islands are essentially are allowed to be birthright citizens after 1986, but can renounce their citizenship and acquire Polynesian nationality or Carolina nationality. And the Virgin Islands are allowed to acquire a birthright citizenship since 1947. So you have all these models that in some ways are, with the exception of the Virgin Islands, are sort of uh, justified, <coughs> at least tacitly, uh, on the case of Puerto Rico. Um, in terms of immigration law, it's a whole different kind of worms because this history has not been incorporated into U.S. immigration law or U.S. immigration history. I, I talk to immigration scholars and they say, "What well, because immigrate now? They were all naturalized in 1917." Well, no, no, they're still being they're still applying for naturalization as late as 1948. So that story hasn't been told, uh, and I can't really say that these debates have influenced U.S. immigration law because very few people know that this happened in the first place. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Um, I was very interested in the talk, and it seems like a, a lot of your analysis centered on um, kind of overseas territories. And one thing I was thinking about as you were talking was the case of 